So the last topic I wanted to discuss before the midterm in terms of sort of crystallizing your knowledge and integrating it is to talk a little bit more about carbon-13 chemical shifts in NMR spectroscopy and structure and stereochemistry determination. Because I think these can be really, really useful in understanding molecular structure. Um, we talked before and sort of said at the simplest level, aliphatic carbons are tip, you know, sort of plain aliphatic carbons are about 10 to 40 ppm. We're going to look a little bit more at some of the factors. So I'm talking now, you know, not anything special in terms of substituents. We're going to talk a little bit about the factors that lead to chemical shifts. It's actually really interesting and really diagnostic in terms of a fingerprint, not just of nearby functional groups, but also of other carbon substituents. Carbons next to an oxygen, typically about 50 to 70 ppm. Carbon-carbon triple bond, typically about 70 to 80 ppm. Uh, alkenes, aromatics, typically about 110 to 150. And again, these numbers are rough numbers. I'm going to show you today just plain ordinary compounds where we see a carbon on an aromatic ring at 160 because it's connected to an oxygen atom. Um, esters and acids, typically about 170 to 180 ppm. And again, conjugation, we'll talk a little bit more about it today. That can shift things one way or another. But what's nice as we run through carbonyls, just like in the proton, uh, just like in the IR, you can say, look at an aldehyde or look at an ester or look at a ketone or look at an amide or look at a carboxylic anhydride or an acid chloride and start to distinguish among all of these, all of these functional groups. Same type of thing with the carbon. So you can use your data together. So typically about 190 for an aldehyde and for a ketone, a little further downfield, about 205 to 220. I guess the one I'll mention here, nitriles, usually about 115 to 125 ppm. And so this is sort of a, a starting point for sort of basic, basic knowledge on here. And that's what we talked about before. And I want to talk a little bit now more about the factors that modulate these numbers here. <clears throat> so let's take a look at some specific effects. Let's start with inductive and resonance effects. In part, because these are really easy to understand. So we can talk about benzene. Benzene is 128.5 ppm. But if you go ahead and put an oxygen on the benzene ring, so you go to say anisole or you go to phenol, now the carbon that's next to that oxygen has the inductive effect of the oxygen. That's going to shift it downfield. So in anisole, we're down to 160. PPM. And of course, when you look at your carbon NMR, you're going to also notice your quats tend to be very short, your carbons without hydrogens attached because of the lack of a nuclear overhauser effect, as well as a longer relaxation time. So almost automatically, you can look at the spectrum and say, oh, that's a quad. I already might expect it to be further downfield. And that oxygen is pumping in electron density into the ring 
So the protons that the carbons that are ortho, right? You can donate electrons in the carbons that are ortho to it end up at about 114. The carbons that are para to it end up at 121. And we're going to be comparing that to 128. So you can see both of these two carbons are electron rich as that carbon is pumping electron density and shielding as the oxygen is pumping electron density and shielding the carbon. But the meta doesn't have much of an effect. So that's sort of a nice, simple example. Alkenes, the same type of thing. So we've talked about uh, electron withdrawing substituents on alkenes in the IR, and we have the same sort of thing. So if you look at cyclohexene, it's 127.5. If you go to cyclohexenone, now that beta carbon, remember that that double bond is pushing electron density into the carbonyl. We see the carbonyl stretching frequency is weaker in the IR spectrum. We see the beta protons downfield in the proton NMR spectrum. And in the carbon NMR spectrum, we see the same thing, 151 parts per million. But the alpha carbon isn't heavily affected. It's at about 129 ppm. And so all of these fit together with our conceptions of resonance, but they also help you refine your understanding of where carbon should be. And in turn, thinking in the other direction to read and interpret the spectrum. And these effects can be really huge. I love the next two examples I'm going to give because they are so extreme. So this compound here, dimethoxyethylene, is also called ketene dimethylacetal. This carbon compound over here, you've got two, two oxygens pushing electron density onto this beta carbon. This molecule is super nucleophilic as far as an alkene goes. It's going to be hydrolytically very labile, even to the mildest of, of aqueous acid. And this carbon is so electron rich that it's down at 45.5 ppm. And then this carbon here with the two oxygens is now 167.9. So if you were looking at the spectrum of this molecule, you'd, you'd never guess this was an alkene carbon. And you'd probably guess that that was an ester carbon. Um, so it's really interesting, these effects that can modulate it. As we get into 2D NMR, you would probably start to say, oh, wow, okay, in the HMQC spectrum, we see a correlation between these alkene protons, which are going to be in the, the 4-ish ppm, 4 to 5 ppm range. We'd see a correlation between the alkene protons and the carbon, so you'd know that something is up. And just as an extreme example, this push-pull compound, dimethyl amino groups are superb <clears throat> electron donors, and cyano groups are good electron withdrawing groups. And so this push-pull compound ends up having really incredible magnetic anisotropy, 39.1 ppm, something you'd never expect for an alkene, and 171.0 ppm for that carbon. So this gives us a feeling of how we can interpret some of these uh, substituent effects and gives us a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of a calibration. All right, so I want to now talk about some effects that we haven't talked about in the carbon NMR. And I want to talk about some substituent effects that you might not think would make a big deal. So alpha alkyl substituents, but they sure add up. Alpha alkyl substituents 
lead to downfield shifting. And this is kind of like what you see in a proton NMR where we think of a methyl group as 0.9 and a methylene group at 1.4 and a methine group at maybe 1.9 ppm or 1.8 ppm. But these effects add up because we're going to see their beta and gamma effects. So again, I'll go to benzene as a starting point. We put a methyl group on it. Remember benzene, we took at a baseline of 128.5 ppm. We put a methyl group on it and now we're at 137 ppm. So think about that. That's about eight or nine ppm extra downfield shifting. Let's take a look at an alkane series. We'll take propane and the methylene is at 16. We put a methyl group on it and now we go to 25, again, about another nine ppm downfield, kind of like what we saw up here. We put another methyl group on it and go to neopentane and now we're at 28 ppm. So we keep, keep moving downfield. And these principles apply. Remember, we talked in proton NMR about empirical additivity relationships. In other words, you can sort of see for one thing, and then you'll see you'll have similar behavior in something else. So if we take ethanol as an example, we're at 58 for the methylene that's next to the oxygen. And we go ahead and we go to isopropanol. And just as we saw a big effect of putting on a methyl up here, we see a big effect over here. Now we go to 64 ppm. So in other words, it's not quite 9 ppm difference, but we go 6 ppm more downfield. And then you go to terbutanol. And now we go to 69 ppm. So here we had, as we added one more methylene, we went downfield by, or one more methyl group, we went three ppm. Here we go five ppm. But it, again, we're sort of ballparking the same types of effects. It's important to keep that in mind uh, as these effects can really add up. So that's your alpha substituents. Let's take a look at beta substitution. Beta substitution doesn't have that much effect in proton NMR, but in carbon NMR, beta substitution has a substantial effect. Beta substitution has an effect of pushing you downfield, not quite as much, but it also pushes you downfield by several ppm. So I'll just take the example of uh, butane here and we'll look at the central methylene group. And now we'll start to add methyl groups to the beta carbon on that butane. So I'll add either one methyl group or I'll add two methyl groups. If we add one methyl group and we look at that methylene, we move to 32 ppm. So we've moved seven ppm downfield, a respectable amount. If we add another methylene, we move another methyl group, we move to 37 ppm. So the effects aren't that much smaller. In fact, they're pretty darn comparable to the alpha substitution effects. And so, so that's sort of surprising. That's one of the reasons why you can get very specific fingerprints for different molecules. And as I progress through this lecture, I'm going to show you how these fingerprints really can be very useful if you can make some sense out of them. So that's your beta effects. I love gamma effects because it's completely counterintuitive in that gamma substitution leads to upfield shifting.
And so what I'll do is I'll come back. I'll, let me show you the basic principle over here. The basic principle, because it is a little bit counterintuitive, is that if we add, right, so this is, if we consider a substituent here would be the alpha position, this a substituent here would be the beta position. If we consider this substituent, it's on the gamma position. And if we look at a methyl group here, if that methyl group is banging into the hydrogen, you're pushing electron density down onto that carbon. So basically, the interactions of the electrons clouds push electron density down onto this carbon, particularly if they're in force. So I'll say E minus electron repulsion. I'll say electron electron repulsion leads to greater electron density on the carbon and that leads to upfield shifting. And that really occurs in the event of enforced steric interaction. So let me show you. Let's take butane and butane, the methyl group is going to be at 13. And if we add one methyl, it can kind of keep out of the way. You can draw a confirmation where that methyl group isn't staring this methyl group in the face. So the effect's pretty small. It's 12 ppm. But if you go ahead and you could think about this by drawing a Newman projection here where you essentially don't end up with a lot of steric interaction. But if I add one more methyl group, then this other methyl group is going to get stared in the face by the extra methyl groups. And now we're going to be up to nine ppm. And we can really see this, if you can't see this as much in an, aliphatic, in an acyclic system, you can really see this in a cyclic system. So if we go to cyclohexane, we're going to be at 27 parts per million. If we go to methyl cyclohexane, the methyl group is going to, on that carbon, on that gamma carbon, it's going to have really no effect because this methyl group is out of the way. So we're still going to be at 27 parts per million. But if we add a second methyl group, oops, didn't mean to add it to that carbon. I'm getting ahead of myself here. If we add a second methyl group, now the axial, one of those methyl groups has to be axial. And we know, we've learned about 1,3 diaxial interactions in conformational analysis. That methyl group that's standing up like a flagpole is pushing into the axial hydrogen, pushing electron density onto the carbon. And the overall result now is we go to 21 ppm, so a big effect. And the reason all of this is significant is it can have be very useful in structure and stereochemistry determination. And I'll give you a, an example later on from Professor Ricknowski that shows really nicely how we can use this in determining some stereochemistry of 1,3 diols. All right, last thing I want to show you at the whiteboard here, I think is some halogen effects, particularly heavy atom effects. So heavy atoms, big atoms like iodine and bromine have big clouds of electrons that will extend outward onto the carbon to which they're bound. And so I want to show you this across the, the halomethanes. So let's start with methane itself. Methane itself is at negative 2.3 ppm. And if we go ahead and consider chlorine, 
bromine and iodine, and we consider the monohalo compound like chloromethane, the dihalo compound like dichloops, like dichloromethane, the trihalo compound like chloroform, and the tetrahalo compound like carbon tetrachloride, we get an increasing number of halogens. And for chlorine, which isn't really that big or heavy an atom, the effects aren't surprising. Chlorine's electronegative. Its electronegativity pulls electron density away from the carbon. So we shifted downfield. 25 <coughs> ppm for one chlorine, 54, 77, and 96 ppm as we go to methylene chloride, chloroform, and carbon tetrachloride. And you'd look at that, you'd say, what's the big deal? No surprise. More, more electronegative atoms, you move further downfield. Now, if we look at bromomethane, you'd say, okay, 10 ppm, I get it. 10 ppm, is not, uh, bromine isn't as electronegative as chlorine. 10 ppm is further downfield than methane. What's the big deal? You add another bromine, you're at 21. You'd say, okay, we move downfield a little bit more. But you add a third bromine, you go to 12 ppm, and you say, okay, wait a second, what's up? And you add a fourth bromine, and you go to negative 29 ppm. Now that's just funky. And of course, what I said is that the bromine electron clouds are extending out and shielding that carbon atom. And by the time you get to iodine, it starts to get really funky. So negative 21 ppm for iodomethane, if you didn't open your spectral window by increasing your sweep width, you'd miss it in the carbon NMR spectrum. Your sweep, your sweep width might take you to negative 10 ppm, but if you didn't open it up, you'd say, oh, I can't see my peak. What's wrong with my spectrum? Well, you didn't look in the right place. You need to open your window. Go to diiodomethane, negative 54. Well, now you really have to be looking for it. You go to iodoform, a beautiful yellow solid. You're at negative 140 and tetraiodo methane and you're at negative 292 ppm. So that is that is unusual or at least at least it is counterintuitive and it's worth worth seeing in one place. And so that's what I wanted to show and share with you there. Thoughts or questions at this point? All right, I wanna talk now because as I said, this really is very powerful for structure determination. I wanna talk about C13 chemical shift prediction. And yes, by the way, on the open book part of the exam, you can use ChemDraw and you can use the chemical shift prediction to check your work. It's a very useful tool. But I wanna, just like we wanna at least know how to do long division before we use a calculator, I want us to at least understand the principles. So the way that ChemDraw works is on empirical additivity relationships. In other words, we take all of these effects of an electron withdrawing substituent shifting you downfield, an alpha substituent shifting you downfield, a beta substituent shifting you downfield, a gamma substituent shifting you upfield. We take all of these effects and we add them up 
starting with a baseline value like methane or like benzene, and you can come up with a pretty good prediction of chemical shift for simple molecules within a few ppm, which means you really can get a nice fingerprint. Now for weird molecules, for funky molecules with weird structures and multiple rings and contorted shapes, then that's not gonna be good. But for simple molecules like we've been seeing in the course, just great. All right, another way our databases either generalized or specific or the equivalent of machine learning where you're basically fitting a data set of different molecules in a database or a very specialized set of molecules like one, two diol acetonides and you're calibrating yourself so that you can then take an unknown molecule and use that calibration to predict. And finally, and very good for sort of weird molecules, molecules that don't resemble other molecules or have many constrained structures, electronic uh, structure calculation where you're going ahead and actually calculating the electron density in the molecule through uh, ab initio calculations or density functional calculations, and then using that to predict the carbon chemical shifts. So I want to at least briefly expose you to examples of all of these. Two of these, the latter two, I'll be giving you examples from the Rignovsky group because they've done such a great job, both with weird molecules and with acetonides. But let's start with the very basic principles. And I wanna direct us at this point to our handout. So I'm going to share my, my iPad screen with you. Sorry about that. I get so few calls, I don't bother to turn off my phone here. Oops, are we getting, you're not seeing my iPad, are you? Ah, okay. Can everyone see my iPad okay? Yes. Great. All right, so let's go to the second page of the handout because I think this is a nice, a nice place to begin. So the second page of the handout is uh, a, just two spectra I took from Aldrich. And they're both one, two, four. So they're both isomers of dichlorophenol. And they're both one, two, four substituted tri-substituted aromatics. And if you look at the proton NMR, I've encouraged you to learn calibration of yourself and recognizing patterns. And we can see a doublet with about three Hertz or two Hertz. And we can see a doublet with about eight Hertz. And we can see a DD with about eight and about three Hertz. I'm just eyeballing it here. And that's sort of a nice clue but if you look at both of these molecules, that's a nice clue for a disubstituted aromatic. You see the same, or a tri-substitute, one, two, four, tri-substituted aromatic, you see the same pattern here. And if you're very clever from proton NMR, you might be able to infer which is which, because we know that the oxygen uh, is electron donating. But to a first order approximation, if I gave you only one of those spectra, You'd be very hard pressed if you only had one spectra. And I said, let's just pretend we only had the top spectrum. And I said, that top spectrum is either this molecule, 
the one on the left, or this molecule, the one on the right, you'd be very hard pressed to come up with the right answer. Now, I wanna show you though, the carbon shifts can be really diagnostic. You'd probably be able to do it based on proton empirical additivity relationships, but you might be a little shakier. I wanna show you in the carbon NMR and I'm only gonna give you a brief survey. So, so in the carbon NMR, we notice something really interesting. We notice our quats are short and we notice we have three tall peaks that are, have hydrogens attached I'm only gonna, we'd, normally I'd concentrate on all six, but for the sake of expediency, I'm gonna concentrate on three of them because I think it's easy to see the ones with the hydrogens attached. So you look at this and you'd say, oh, okay, well, we have two of them at about 128. And we have one of them at maybe about 100 and, I don't know, say about 117-ish. And if we look at the other one, we see a very different pattern. We see one of them at maybe 132. And then we see one at like, you know, 118-ish. and one at like 116-ish. In other words, we see only one of those methines downfield. And we can go ahead and we can add up and figure out what we would expect for each of those methines. And so I wanna show you off your table and I'm gonna give you one example and then we'll go to ChemDraw. And I want to look at this carbon here. So we're going to just focus on this because this, just like I said, I want you to sort of know how to do long division at least once before we use our calculator. I want us to look at this one carbon. This one carbon is ortho to a hydroxy group and meta to two chlorines. And so we can go ahead and calculate the predicted chemical shift. And the way you do this, and Silverstein gives you a nice example of it, is we're gonna start with the baseline value of benzene of 128.5. And then we're then going to add correction factors for an ortho substituent that's a hydroxy and a meta substituent that's a chloral. And so we go over to our table and I've given you the appendix from Silverstein from one of the many uh, issues, uh, uh, volumes of, uh, of uh, editions of Silverstein that I have. And we look over here and we say, ah, okay, a meta hydroxy group is, or an ortho hydroxy group gives a substituent effect of negative 12.7. And then we can look at our effects for chlorine. And we say, ah, okay, a meta chloro group is, 1.0. And so we go back and we'd say, okay, to calculate our empirical additivity relationships, we would subtract 12.7. We'd add 1.0. We'd for the metachlorine, we'd add 1.0 for the other metachlorine. And when we tally all of that up, we'd expect this carbon to be at 117.8. And we can do the same thing over here. And we'd expect this carbon to be at 128.3. And we can do the same thing over here, just looking at our table. Now we have two orthochlorines and a meta hydroxy group. And we'd expect this carbon to be 130.5. And I can do this same thing over for this one and I'd expect this to be 116.8, and I'd expect this to be 131.3, and I'd expect this to be 117.0. And you look at this and you say, oh, even from these very simple calculations, we see a huge difference. 
One of these bins, and we do it for all six in practice, but I just wanted to show you real quick how, how easy this was. The benzene on the left, the dichlorophenol on the left, has two downfield methines and one more upfield methine. And the, benz the dichlorophenol on the right has one downfield methine and two more upfield methines. In other words, this molecule clearly matches this spectrum and this molecule clearly matches that spectrum. And that's how easy it is to do this. And that's how powerful it is where we've essentially taken the guesswork out of this. And once you've done that once, then you're in a good shape to go ahead and say, okay, I've done this by hand one time. I understand the basic principles and ChemDraw is going to, you know, no magic involved. It's going to be doing essentially the exact same thing. And I will share my screen with you once again. And I will go to my ChemDraw window and I will put in my two dichlorophenols. I'll select the molecule on the left and I'll do predict carbon chemical shifts. And can you see that? Can you see it's done it for me here? So for the methylenes, it's predicted 128.7, 129.4, and 117.3. And then if I do this one over here, and it's essentially using the same calculations. There's a generalized correction term in there. That's a small term, but basically it's doing essentially the same calculation. James? Um, yeah. Is, um, is it doing this in like, um, like different solvents? Oh yeah, yes. Different solvents will make a difference of a, PP, a few ppm. So these numbers are all good to a few ppm. And you'll notice again, we get essentially the same numbers out of here. So absolutely, absolutely. It is going to depend on solvent, but the substituent effects, the gross substituent effects that we saw in this case, you know, roughly 10 ppm range just on those methine, on those methine carbons, on those CH carbons, and there'd be similar effects on the quats. I just didn't show it. Those effects there end up being the predominant thing regardless of solvent. The solvent. James and I will often do this. When we have a spectrum that say has bad overlap, when we run it in deuterochloroform and we think it's going to make for a hard problem for, for you, or in our own research, we just want to disperse things a little bit more, we'll switch to deuterobenzene, which creates its own magnetic anisotropy and will shake things up a little bit. Other questions? I want to just take us through a couple of other methods of chemical shift prediction now, and I'll show you a couple of cute stories with them along the way. So let me go ahead and I'll go back to the handouts on the iPad. So back to the handouts that I handed out. All right. So one thing people have also done is databases and machine learning, where basically you use a training set the training set of molecules 
creates correlations and they basically can then tell you how good the training set matches the calculated values, the calculated values being a global fit. And that will help you use the database to trust your values for, um, for additional molecules. So the example here in the handout has to do between two tautomers, but basically this is their training set where they have the, uh, the uh, calculated value on one axis, the observed value on the other. And in general, we're talking about plus or minus three PPM. In other words, in general, and this is kind of a useful rule of thumb, on the average, not for every carbon, but on the average across a molecule, it's generally possible to predict your carbon chemical shifts with a standard deviation of about three parts per million by a variety of techniques. Now, a beautiful, so this is sort of a generalized database, but I wanna show you a specific database. And you should think about this for your own project if say you're working on a methods project. And I'll show you this example from the Ricknowski group. So the Ricknowski group has been really interested in one, two, in one, three diols, because one, three diols are a big part of many natural products. And the question in many one, three diols that you're synthesizing is what's the relative stereochemistry? Are the two diols syn or anti? And the Ricknowski group was working with acetonides and they started to notice a very interesting pattern. So they would be making acetonides of the 1,3-diol. And they noticed that whenever you had the syn 1,3-diol, you would end up with the two methyls of the acetonide very differentiated. And they plotted all of their data that they had published and they saw that one of those methyls would be at about 20 parts per million and the other would be at about 30 parts per million. And that upfield methyl, that's what we talked about before. This upfield methyl ends up having the gamma effect of those hydrogens and so it shifted up field by that gamma effect, by that steric effect. So they're very differentiated. But the anti-diols, you have a different conformation. You have a twist conformation where neither of them is upfield, is you know, where they're very similar in chemical shift and in the middle. And so this is what you would see for the anti-diol which means for this specific class of compounds, the Ricknowski group now had a perfect prediction, a very specific litmus test. If you make a 1,3-diol acetonide and the two methyl groups fall at 20 and 30 parts per million, it's a syn acetonide. If you make a 1,3-diol acetonide and the methyl groups fall somewhere in the middle and aren't differentiated, it's a trans, it's an anti-acetonide. That's an example of a specific database. They basically made this, validated it, and now you have a predictor tool. And they're not the only group who's done it. The Kishi group, and this would just be another, another example. The Kishi group was interested in one in uh, uh, propionate compounds, in polypropionates where you have uh, alpha methyl hydroxy compounds. So you'd have four stereocenters in a row. They went ahead and they said, okay, we'll make our own little table. We'll make every possible stereoisomer. So eight diastereomers here they made. And they were able to see the effects on the carbon chemical shifts. And so you, you go ahead and as a graduate student, your synthetic methods project is first, we're going to make all eight of this model compound diastereomers. And then we can use the template, the patterns that we get for the eight for all different uh, 
molecules that we make. So this is another example where you can do the basic training work and then you go ahead and you get a fingerprint for your molecule. And so that's another sort of example of a tool where you're using carbon NMR chemical shifts. And these are useful things. The very final thing I wanted to show you for sake of exposure is electronic structure calculations. And this was just a beautiful example by the Rignovsky group. So in Angavanta Kimi about, um, oh, almost about 15 years ago, a paper appeared by James J. LeClaire, who claimed to synthesize a uh, natural product and he claimed to synthesize this natural product called hexacyclinol. And he said, this is the molecule I synthesized. And he presented NMR spectra of the molecule. He, it was a sole author paper. He didn't have a laboratory. Well, he kind of has a laboratory, but basically he said he did it in his garage. And the chemical community reacted with shock. They felt this must be BS. This must be, be fabricated. But how do you prove that it's fabricated? And it turns out, so this was a natural product that had been reported. So Professor Rignovsky said, well, I'm going to do, I'm going to check this out because I don't even think, I didn't, don't think a synthesis would work. And I don't think they got the natural product structure right. So he did electronic structure calculations that basically allow you to figure out the electron densities in a molecule and calculate the carbon NMR chemical shifts. And he calibrated himself by taking a known molecule or actually several known molecules and calculating, you know, funky polycyclic molecules and calculating the chemical shifts of the resonances by these electronic structure calculations. And his calibration said, I generally get them on the average plus or minus two ppm with the biggest outliers. Of plus or minus five ppm. In other words, this method is good within a couple of ppm. So he then went ahead and he took the published structure, the James J. LeClaire, an original natural product structure of hexacyclinol, and calculated the carbon chemical shifts. And this is where I don't think the graph does justice, because look at the scale here and look at the scale here. The scale on the, on the training graph is within 5 ppm. The scale on the, on the calculation for, for hexacyclinol is, plus or, is 25 ppm. And he found that the numbers deviated by plus or minus seven. In other words, compared to his training set, the fit didn't work very well. But he, he went ahead and he inferred where the structure of the original natural product was wrong and did electronic structure calculations for the natural product, the correct structure, and he got it at plus or minus two ppm. In other words, while he never said that James J. LeClaire committed fraud out of whole cloth fabricated a synthesis of the structure on the left, but he said the structure on the right is the real structure of hexacyclinol. And implicitly, so how in heck could this published fabricated synthesis that would have potentially led to the structure on the left. How could he have really synthesized it? He simply made this up and it created quite a stir in the chemical community. So anyway, it was a 
an interesting story, but it shows how for something that's an unusual structure where it's just not practical to uh, use empirical additivity relationships or close resemblances in a database, you can go ahead and say, okay, the fingerprint matches or the fingerprint doesn't match or the fingerprint matches something else. So for those people working in natural product synthesis, where you're dealing with very complicated polycyclic contorted molecules, like maybe, maybe the Pronin group or the Rychnovsky group or the Van der Waal group might be interested in, um, these types of electronic structure calculations can be really, really valuable. But for sort of run of the mill, simple compounds like the ones we're often encountering, at least in the first half of this course, um, maybe, maybe less so for strychnine, although even strychnine, you'd probably do a pretty good job on. Um, but you certainly can use empirical additivity relationships. So I think at this point, that's about what I wanted to say. I will take any last questions. Does anyone, does anyone have any last questions on the mechanics of the exam? And I'll, then I, as I said, I will take specific questions at my office hours, but anyone on the mechanics of doing it, handing it back, et cetera. All right, I will email it to you tomorrow morning at nine o'clock.